Good day to everyone. This is Venture Investor Economic Podcast by InMind. And today our guest is Investment Director of Flashpoint Venture Capital Firm, Anton Fedorov. Hi, Anton. Hi, Nelly. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your time today. I know that you are joining us from Israel, where there is an office of uh, your venture capital firm. Uh, how are you during these days? Good, good. We're, we're staying positive, staying positive um, in this challenging environment. Let's go with uh, that. As far as I understand, Flashpoint Venture Capital invests in software businesses and marketplace. Uh, so you should feel quite good during these lockdown times with your portfolio companies. So, yeah, so just to give a bit of background about Flashpoint. So, Flashpoint uh, is an alternative asset manager uh, operating across uh, Central and Eastern Europe and Israel. Um, we have six offices headquartered in London, and then we have five regional offices across Israel, uh, Budapest, Warsaw, Riga, uh, and Moscow. Um, and uh, indeed, we are investing into SaaS businesses and marketplaces uh, across multiple verticals. So we are um, fortunate, misfortunate to, to actually have a variety of verticals that are both seeing a rise of demand and some are seeing a collapse of demand. So, um, so we're seeing both sides of the, of the market. Um, and everybody is reacting differently, of course, and uh, depending on the circumstances. Um, so in a sense, we, we have quite a unique view um, on, on what's going on and how to best position yourself going forward. Can you share this unique view then? Well, I mean, it depends from like from whose perspective you're looking. Uh, if you're looking, for example, from uh, from the startup uh, founders, um, I think there are basically two com two verticals how you would split it. So the first one is as winners in a sense that uh, see rise of the demand. So those companies that see rise of demand, like telemedicine and, for example, same day delivery. Uh, those companies are obviously well positioned to even speed up their uh, their developments, their acquisition strategies, etc. Uh, but with a caveat that they should always have enough uh, cash runway to um, for the next, I would say, eighteen to twenty-four months, uh, because the fundraising environment is is volatile. And although there is money in the market, uh, it's always imperative that you maintain kind of a healthy cash position. Because fundraising can, can take anywhere between a month and a year. Um, so that's, uh, so all of those guys, they're either looking to, to do an internal round for growth, um, or they're, they're seeking uh, basically external capital and there's demand for that. Um, so that's the, the positive kind of the winner is cool. Uh, the, the less, the misfortunate one is, is the companies that, that don't have the rise of demand, but have a fall of demand and, um, like travel vertical or HR vertical. Uh, so, so those guys, they, 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 you'll have a subset of two companies uh, of two sets of companies in, in that bucket. So first of all, you have a companies that are, I would say cash rich that raised rounds, uh, last year. Um, and. Uh, I think those guys are in a better position overall because I think their biggest asset is, is actually the cash and their ability to fundraise um, historically. So they're all kind of basically optimizing for cash. So that's the, that's the, the framework that uh, is in place right now. So yes, there are massive cuts. Uh, there's massive lay temporary layoffs uh, happening across like multiple verticals. Uh, but uh, the, the most important is to, to make sure that you optimize as much cash as possible until the end of the year or until the dust settles. And then there's a third bucket of, uh, of companies, and unfortunately we don't have those, uh, uh, but we see uh, startups that are basically, they have a fall of the demand and they don't have cash. So, um, so those companies are at the biggest risk in this environment and most likely those businesses will uh, will go bankrupt uh, over the course of the next three to six months um, because uh, it's just uh, I mean they weren't lucky enough to, to get 
cash end of last year or in the first two months. And, and unfortunately, nobody in this environment is, is willing to fund uh, those types of businesses. Um, so, but that's kind of like to, on a high level, to structure like, three types of groups of companies uh, that, we, that we see. Um, and uh, it's obviously important to have winners uh, and, uh, and, uh, but also it's important to, to make sure that the companies that don't see a rise of demand because of the cyclicality of the economy and, uh, and in general this, this COVID crisis uh, to, to make the right decisions because if, if you don't preserve cash um, you are being left with a, with a drainy bucket that will go bankrupt not in six months but in 12 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Anton, thanks for um, summarizing these three segments of our startups, um, which are feeling effect of uh, COVID and pandemic and market crash. But can you go into details about effect on VCs? I mean, starting from your company, um, do you feel um, some risks uh, in the fundraising for the um, VC? Uh, on your perspective uh, or many be some problems in your LPs and uh, do you also feel some changes uh, in the investment focus uh, or whatever? Well, I mean, if you're talking from the fund perspective, yeah. uh, I mean, we, we as a fund, we're basically operating a third fund. So, um, so for us, uh, right now is actually a good time to, um, to, 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 to start investing because the history shows that in 2001 uh, to 2002 and 2009, 2010, those were actually the best years that VCs has, have, have made money. So it, it, it then depends on who are your LPs and how cash rich they are. Um, but, uh, but in terms of VC investing, like the next 12 to 24 months, Will probably yield the best cohort of investments uh, possible um, over the course of I don't know, probably next five to seven years, uh, because the valuation expectations are already going down. Um, the although there is dry power in the funds, nobody, everybody is cautious, and um, so the the asks of the founders um, they're they're also trimmed down uh, by sometimes thirty to forty percent. Uh, because they they want to make sure that they survive. Uh, so so from that perspective, um, it's actually like a very good time to 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 to, to invest. Um, it, it depends where though, uh, because there are some sectors that experience um, rise of demand, and then there's some sectors that don't. So it, it, it's it's important that your investment strategy that you're selling to the LPs. Is aligned with, with the sectors that are most likely to benefit from, from this environment. And on your perspective, how do you think, on your personal opinion, uh, what sectors will fly uh, during and after this um, situation? Well, the way the way we look at it, I think there is two mega trends happening in the market. Um, I think the first one is is obviously like going remote. Um, and there, there's, there's different ways how to interpret that. Um, one, if it's like more on the B2C side, it's more about just a further push of on, offline channels to online channels. Uh, and uh, I mean, you all see that uh, the share even of Netflix has been prior, prior to prices, I think 40 to 45%, I think it's gonna go above 50 for sure. And that's on the massive scale. So uh, they see unprecedented volumes. Uh, and so more businesses uh, will, or like for example, telemedicine, uh, that basically switch the channel from offline going to clinics to, to online, be doing the video conferencing, et cetera. So that's like trend number one. And, and the mega trend number two is, I think it, it goes into more economics that there is a there is an upcoming crisis, uh, which, which we already see in the temporary layoffs uh, all across, um, whether it's Israel, whether it's US, um, but we're seeing unprecedented amount of um, basically jobless claims um, that uh, if you normalize the data, we're, we're looking at 20 to 25% unemployment rates. Unemployment rate in Israel is already beyond 25%. Um, so 
although it's somewhat temporary and uh, we'll get back to this 10 15 level once restaurants start to open and hospitality sector reopens um, uh, but but still, uh, it's uh, it's much higher than with what we just saw in 2008, 2009, much higher. Um, so that's kind of like term number one. So so the way we look at sectors is is trying to to find sectors which are basically intersection of those two mega trends. Um, and there 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 are definitely some winners, uh, like for example, telemedicine, teleconferencing. Um, that uh, basically go like less into less travel means more basically online activity, right? So that's why you see Zoom case like just unprecedented uh, growth. Uh, company grew three times over the course of like three months um, on on a on a scale of hundreds of millions of users. So um, you see uh, basically same day delivery, for example, growing enormously. The growth of new customers has accelerated. Three four times so and that lays a foundation for for growth to come in the in the in the coming quarters. You see cybersecurity as kind of a byproduct of going remote as well um, in this environment, and uh, it's less it's less it's it's definitely has a trend of remote going inside of it, uh, but it has less of a uh, kind of e-commerce uh, not e-commerce but uh, uh, the the decline in the economic activity. Um, but still, uh, the, the fear of remote and the security risk is, is quite high. Um, gaming and entertainment is always kind of like the the winners in the in the downturn environment um, because people are laid off work. They need a place for uh, to kind of regroup, so they they turn into entertainment, and um, and that's uh, you see a rise of demand there. Um, so those probably like are the sectors that we're looking in the short term. And as we deepen into the crisis, uh, I think some some more industries will emerge as kind of a byproduct of uh, of some industries being cut off of funding and uh, just changing behavior of the consumers. That's interesting to understand. Uh, did you change your or move a little bit, shift a little bit your investment focus since the pandemic started and you? realized that there are obvious uh, segments uh, technological sectors which will have huge demand not only in the nearest months but also in the next uh, three five years did you shift your investment focus i think in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, high level focus on uh, softwares companies and marketplaces we have not because we strongly believe in the in the monetizable technology so I think where we slightly adjusted our uh, our target search criteria as is, is in the sectors. So we were pretty bullish on uh, property technologies um, in the last couple of years, and uh, obviously with this uh, with this change in, in kind of remote trend, uh, the property technologies is is less of a uh, is less of a focus from the investors. Uh, perspective because you see a lot of people basically staying at home and even as the, as the economy is reopen um, I think there's going to be change of the behavior how how prop how office managers basically will will have to adapt to this environment I think there's going to be a lot of empty spaces right so um, although there is there, there might be some winners in this in this niche but as a, as a whole marker trend uh, the vertical of property technologies might might experience uh, some downturn uh, in the next year or two in terms of overall funding in the niche. Um, same as kind of travel, right? So when when the economy is strong, you are people are traveling, they're spending uh, dollars. Um, and when you're heading into the recession, the travel um, it will bounce back, obviously because we're just we hit it so low um, that uh, there is. Nowhere to go but up, uh, and, and this and, and right now, uh, especially seeing kind of April numbers. Um, but uh, overall, the funding for travel is, is going to be significantly less than it was before. And you, as an investor in early stage companies uh, at Series A, you are relying to some extent on on later on investors at Series B stage and Series C stage to come and 
and invest uh, after you. So if the overall funding diminishes, uh, it's much harder to raise a proper, uh, proper next round um, for the business. So obviously we're trying to, to push to the sectors that will expect to see more uh, dollars flowing into them. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that is quite clear that you already had a strong uh, and a broad focus on this uh, software and marketplace industry. How many companies from your portfolio are benefiting from the situation? I would say it's, um, I would say there, there, we have a few companies that were in property technologies HR. Um, so like, I think less than five. And then we have basically a few companies like online education um, because we are actually a strong investor in online education that has been going up. Um, I think about a quarter of the companies are experiencing um, the, the rise of the demand. And then I have some companies that actually, actually the business as usual. So uh, they don't actually see a rise of the demand, but they don't see a fall of the demand as well. So. So in a sense, they're just growing as they were about 100% year over year. Um, and, and most likely their plans have changed to get to break even much faster than they were planning to. So they're not hiring as aggressively, or just freeze hiring for the time being. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Because if they raise money, they'll rehire. As, because all the growth of the companies in SaaS business is always people dependent. Mm -hmm. So, so you have, if you have funds to hire people, you will. We make these videos in order to dilute geographical and administrative borders and to help you get closer to international investors, venture capitalists, market experts and startup hubs, irrespective of what country or part of the world you are based in. And we need your support. If you like this video, please don't forget to put like button to subscribe to our channel and if you find it useful I will appreciate if you share it with your teammates co-founders or social media networks thank you and see you in the next videos and what about your investment mode and decision-making process what I mean here is that uh, I don't know if you had previously experience in investing only via online communication without personal meetings with founders uh, but right now, obviously, you can't uh, meet personally. So are you considering and doing investments only online? Well, I think it's important because we're not the first check to come into the company. So, so for us, for example, somebody already did a due diligence on the, on the founders and, and we being uh, quite deep into all the markets that we operate, we, we, we know all the counterparties. So we know their strengths and weaknesses in a sense. Um, so when we were actually investing in Israel four years ago, uh, we didn't have an office. So we only opened an office a year ago, um, while, while doing five deals, uh, remotely, uh, not being present in Israel. So, so for us, uh, not much has really changed, uh, because we're still conducting the same type of video calls and, uh, and getting the data via email from founders, um, and, and analyzing the data and seeing if the data makes sense to, to invest. Uh, obviously, it's important to kind of get a personal vibe, but after six, seven, ten calls, you, you get a sense of, uh, of what a person is like. Uh, so uh, and I don't think a personal touch in this environment would, would significantly differ your opinion about a person. You mean uh, it will become very subjective and biased? I mean, it, the video in itself has become of such a good quality that there's not too much that you can get uh, from a personal meeting that you couldn't have gotten via, via, via Zoom call or, um, or, or, I mean, so you're not investing based on a telephone call. So, so you're still seeing a person how he reacts and whether you have a sense of uh, whether your gut tells you should you partner with this guy or not. Uh, so, um, so all of the mimics and all of the kind of nonverbal communication, uh, it still shows in the video.
Okay, okay, awesome to hear that uh, you are not uh, limited in the um, decision making, or uh, more even uh, actions, taking actions only after uh, private meetings, like many other VCs do. Uh, and what about deal origination process? I guess you have a lot of referrals from your trusted partners, network, venture partners coming in uh, with recommendations, uh, but do you also uh, do inbound um, search for startups uh, through online platforms or online pitches, online events? Well, there, there are two types of funds. So there, there are marketing driven funds and then there are sales driven funds. So, so we as an organization has, has it's been predominantly sales-driven fund. So we actually proactively search for companies. Uh, we have our own our tickers uh, and, and IT system that basically tracks hundreds of companies in real time and, and tells us if somebody has an uptick in some of their metrics. And so we can proactively narrow the search and at any given point focus our efforts on getting to the companies that are actually experiencing growth whether we see it's in the traffic or whether it's uh, just the number of people are getting like uh on the rise so so we actually have a pretty good scoring system internally that allows us to to do a narrow uh, narrow search and go outbound in a sense um that what has gotten us most of our deals actually that is a very interesting i've never heard about that that vc has our uh, own software which allows to uh, make this global parsing did i understand you correctly that this is some kind of it infrastructure developed by your team yes we yes we 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 have we have a, we have a team internally that basically does uh it does it automation in terms of sourcing so mm -hmm. um so we have we didn't build our own crm so we took a off-the-shelf CRM, but in terms of running scripts on it, uh, we, we have actually gotten pretty far. Mm -hmm. And uh, do I understand correctly that actually you do not uh, put in this um, system uh, only those companies with whom you already communicated, it actually uh, parse it, makes parsing and monitoring of various of startups participating in whatever events, competitions or platforms and it tracks yes exactly in a sense i mean in, in in the tracking we have about i think six or seven hundred thousand companies that that are basically in the universe so so obviously we don't invest everywhere but in the in the regions where we do invest ce and israel and, and cis baltics uh we cover quite a lot so we're actually seeing and then we can easily cross compare uh how much funding did the company already get versus like the amount of traction and we understand the business model usually from just looking at the website so you you can get a pretty good sense of how much the company is making in this environment and and whether it even makes sense to reach out or not so uh at the end of the day you reach you talk to everyone uh but it's a, it's a question how do you prioritize uh because there's the fund we we have several products and it's important that even if we don't do like an equity investment we also have a venture debt investment so um we arm which which invests in later stage companies so uh so having an early sort of warning system uh is imperative to to being inside the company uh, and just starting the dialogue uh, in advance so this system actually if it sees notices that uh the traffic of one of the startups increased three times during last week uh it gives you some alarm and then you look at it more precisely Precisely, yes. Mm -hmm. And did you think over uh, sharing uh, this uh, Unix system as a service with uh, other investors? Well, for now, we're calibrating the system because, I mean, this is something that we've done over the last uh, three, four months, basically. And then uh, for us, that's kind of a part of the investment process that, uh, that we utilize. So if we got into enough state uh, where where we've calibrated the system enough um and and we have big, gotten bigger ourselves that we cannot do everything i mean i'm not it's kind of a type of a similar web solution uh so where you just like you can look at uh, go into silver web and and see like if, if things are going but uh but you're just doing that on massive scale and not combining just the traffic but, but other metrics as well 
Okay, okay, got yeah. And do you implement some kind of artificial intelligence there? No, not yet. So uh, I think where we've gotten uh, kind of AI capabilities um, is, is because in many geographies we have we have founders that are Israelis, for example, but they don't necessarily list themselves as an Israeli. So they live in London, or they live in Spain, or they live in Paris, or they live in the East Coast. So, so how do you find those companies? So, so the only way you, you can actually do that is, is through kind of the person's name, uh, because they're not, and sometimes they're not in the local phone portfolio because he's actually residing in New York, but his R&D is in Israel, but uh, they're not in the databases, they're listed not as an Israeli company. So we've developed a system basically that uh, takes the person's name and, and, and looks at his heritage based on his name. And that way we can, when you actually look at uh, 500,000 companies, you can actually look which are like truly, like for example, Israelis or, or Polish founders or Czech founders or Hungarian founders just based on their like uh, first and last name um, and understand uh, that they actually fit your criteria and uh, whom you can invest. So that's a good way to using AI and machine learning to to look for immigrants. Um, so that we do utilize. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is uh, really interesting. So actually, if uh, the founder uh, marries uh, someone and changes the family name, then the artificial intelligence will give the wrong result. Well, usually you see that in the 90% of cases, uh, CEOs are male, they don't change their last name. Um, and, and most certainly, if even if the last name changes, you usually still have the first name, which is a good indication of the heritage anyways. So uh, using a, an AI system allows you to kind of like take both parts of that. And, uh, and then it's just a question, where do you put your, where you put your threshold of false positives, but uh, the system is quite accurate. It's like 99.5% accurate. And is it important to know the heritage of the founders? I mean, um, you invest in certain regions and the company is, uh, uh, is developing, is registered in those regions and R&D and is there? Yes, uh, usually the way we see the setup because of the, uh, the investment strategy works in the fund is we, we like certain uh, founders uh, from certain regions. Um, and and the, why we like them is, is their R&D and the expense uh, is usually is still domestic and is much cheaper versus European counterparts or, or US counterparts. So, so even if the CEO is living in the US, um, the R&D usually with a, 95% chance it's, it's going to be still in Israel uh, or in Czech or in Croatia or like other regional sea countries on Poland. So, um, or even in Russia. So we see a lot of, like, there's a lot of companies that found their moves to the Silicon Valley or New York while development is either in Ukraine or, or, in, uh, or in Moscow. Um, so, so that's kind of... Um, what allows us to find teams that try to pitch themselves as non uh, non Israeli or non uh, or like basically local wise uh, like New York startups and uh, but but uh, but they're trying to to take away their heritage and we're trying to 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 give them back their heritage so um, that's what really happened and uh, for us it's actually a good a good source of uh, of interesting companies because if the CEO is in, is in, in, is in the already uh, is an immigrant uh, and has settled in. Uh, and then has it means he has a stronger chance of actually raising at a higher valuation the next round from a local investor in the U.S. Because the valuations in general in the U.S. are are, are higher, and he's closer to the end client. Most clients are in the Europe, Western Europe, or or U.S. So being closer to client is actually it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Anton, uh, while preparing for this interview, I found out that Flashpoint made a special survey of COVID-19 impact among startup founders and VC companies uh, from your partnering network. Can you please uh, give a few highlights of what in results impressed you most of all or you find most significant? Uh, yes, so, so we did run a survey. Basically, uh, the subset uh, was uh, a couple of dozen VCs uh, from our core agency, Israel, Finland, Baltics. Uh, and then there were about, um, about half a hundred, uh, uh, basically, tech companies, um, more actually non, not in our portfolio, but the companies that we talked to, just raised some funds, et cetera. And I think the most, um, the most, Counterintuitive uh, um, thing that we noticed is that well, founders underestimate uh, the impact versus their investors. So their investors are actually much more pessimistic about the outlook, um, and and usually it's because they've seen uh, multiples of cases how bad can it get um, and how good can it get uh, versus the founders. So the founders. Are thinking the impact is just temporarily it's like kind of three next three four to six weeks it's going to be like bad but then it'll recover but it doesn't so so that's kind of i think where the the controversial uh is the state number one the second one is is in 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 way of how how far do you think you have cut your expenses because some of the companies already cut expenses. So, so the investors thinking that they have already done uh, optimizations uh, to the fullest extent, and the founders are, are basically saying that they haven't. So, so there's always, so, so in transparency of information between like how the founders look at their business and how the, the, the investors who sit on the board look at their businesses, there's a mismatch. So, um, and, and usually when there is a mismatch, it's something is about to, uh, usually when there is a mismatch, it's most likely that bad things are going to happen. Um, so I think like an advice to, 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 to the startups is to make sure that you actually align yourself with the investors. Uh, because if things uh, somewhat shit hits the fan that bad and you haven't really aligned yourself, uh, there is no way an investor is going to back you up. If you've been very transparent with your investor about the situation, how things are going, and what steps are you mitigating, there is a still strong chance that even if things don't recoup, recoup for you, but the way you treated the situation and the way you treated the investor will, will be meaningful that he can actually go and, and write you another I don't know, half a million dollar check, like $300,000 check, which, which might basically be like the, the the savings uh of your company so uh i think that's kind of like where we saw the most uh misalignment between the founders and the investors um and um and that's probably the the only recommendation i can i can get uh, give to the founders um to kind of uh, as a result um but we do think in general that this 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 crisis um, if you're not experiencing, you should be saving not the company, but the cash because everything takes longer. People are trying to adjust themselves and they're changing their views, especially when the company, when the VCs are changing their views, everything is going to take longer. So um, just wishful thinking that it's all going to blow over uh, relatively quickly um, is the wrong one. So uh, if you're trying to save the company and, and delaying the process to fire people, if you haven't already, or to put people on, on temporary leave um, and optimize your, your burn, that, that now is the time to save cash and not the company, in a sense. Yeah, that's very good advice, especially uh, about the be, being transparent and honest with investors, uh, relevant not only for VC and startup industry, but, but for all businesses. The last question for today, Anton. Um, 
among those startup founders who will be watching this video interview, there will be plenty of those who would like to pitch to Flashpoint and uh, to raise uh, funds from your VC. Uh, how to ensure that they will trigger your attention? What uh, is uh, the profile and the portrait of the really good startup you are looking at? Well, I think we, we've always been investing in, in businesses that are fueled by technology. So for us, as an investor, um, a technology by itself is not, uh, it's not a validation. So for us, it's important that, um, that you have a subset of customers that are, that are willing to pay for your product and that you have a, a, a strong channel um, that, that brings those clients. So once you kind of like hit those two um, and, and started to make usually anywhere between, I would say 30 and $100,000 a month, would be keen to talk to you. And just depending on the growth and the industry that you're doing, um, we might immediately write a check. Like we might uh, prolong the discussion towards seeing more growth and, and then uh, invest later. Uh, but um, but we're open to, to to new investments, especially in the sectors that fit this anti-crisis uh, remote um, trends um, that we believe are are going to be uh, are going to be winners in this volatile environment. So, um, so I'm happy to happy to talk to to anybody who kind of fits that um, and take it from there. Awesome. Then we will add uh, the details about your uh, links. Uh, and application sure. forms, uh, to the description Absolutely. of the interview and uh, I encourage everyone who feels that you are strong enough and uh, have a great technology behind to pitch to Anton uh, please don't hesitate get well prepared listen to the advice very attentively and then go and pitch thanks a lot Anton for your time today and I wish you great success with your portfolio companies and with new investments during this turbulent time thank you Nelly